فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل واشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه والتابعين لهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اما بعد ان شاء الله تعالى um, we're going to carry on the explanation of the kitab at tibyan fi adab hamalat al quran written by al imam al imam al nawawi rahimahu Allah we spoke about the times when the um, sujood al tilawa what's the ruling pertaining to the times when the prayer is prohibited the times when the prayer is prohibited what is the ruling regarding sujood al tilawa can you do sujood al tilawa at the al fil awqat al manhiyu anha now we spoke about that we're now going to go into the next section section it is not permissible to bow instead of prostrate as long as one is able to prostrate, post, prostrate. this is the correct view according to our school and according to the vast majority of scholars so, so this is the view held by madhhab jamahir al ulama min al salaf wal khalaf that a person la yaqum al ruku' maqam al sujood he doesn't stand um, the position of a ruku' in the place of a sujood tilawa when he has a choice to do so. Naam. Abu Hanifa, on the other hand, held the view that bowing can take the place of prostration. The majority of scholars derive their evidence from the established fact that bowing cannot take the place of the necessary prostrations during prayer. Those unable to prostrate, however, should lean forward and lower their heads, as, it, as is done in gesturing. And this has been dealt with above. This, this topic, which is that, if a person is unable to do sujood or they are unable to pray like that, what's the ruling pertaining to it? I've actually spoken about it in details. I made a series about it, which I, on YouTube I called it Pray on the Chair. So what's the ruling of praying on the chair? We spoke about it in details there. Now. Section. The method of prostrating for recitation. The prostration of recitation is made in either of two situations. So he's now going to tell you how the prostration should be done. The sajda here is sajda to tilawa. How is it done? Naam. First, outside of prayers. Second, during prayers. So the first one is whilst the person is praying. And the second one is when the person is not, is not praying. Naam. That which pertains to the first situation outside of prayers is as follows. One desiring to make the prostration of recitation outside the prayer must first form the intention and then make the takbir at ihram saying Allahu Akbar. Lift his hand up to his, to his shoulder as he does in prayer and then make another takbir before prostrating, this time without raising his hands. The second takbir is recommended but not a condition as in the case of a necessary pr prostration during the prayer. There are three opinions regarding the necessity of the first takbir, takbir al ihram. The first opinion, and that held by the majority of scholars, is that it is a pillar and that the prostration is not valid without it. The second opinion is that it is recommended and that leaving it out will not invalidate the prostration. This is also the opinion of Sheikh Abu Muhammad al Juwaini. That's the father of Abu Ma'ali al Juwaini, that's his dad. Abu Muhammad al Juwaini is the father of the author of Al Waraqat. That's his dad. Okay. The third and final opinion is that neither a pillar nor is it compulsory, and Allah knows best. If the individual who intends to make the prostration of recitation is standing, he should make takbir takbir to the ihram while standing and then another takbir while falling to prostrate. And this is what we've just described. If the individual is sitting on the floor, however, some of our companions have stated that it is recommended for him to stand up and make the takbir to ihram and then fall straight into prostration. They give evidence for this view by comparing this situation to prayers and the prostration therein. Among the Shafi'i scholars who share this opinion and emphatically hold to it 
Abu Muhammad al Juwaini, Al Qadi al Hussein, and two and, and his two companions, the author of At Tahdib and At Tahdib, and Imam Abu Al Qasim al Rafi. Imam Al Haramain mentioned that his father, Abu Muhammad, was obviously. So, uh, Imam Al Haramain is who? Abu Ali al Juwaini, right? The author of Al Waraqat. He mentions of his father, Abi Muhammad, right? So he mentions his father's opinion and he rejects it. When it comes to knowledge, there is no father and son relationship. So, is there? There is no father and son relationship. You're allowed to reject your father's opinion, prove how wrong he is. Nah. You said about his father's opinion, I do, I do not see any proof for this. This would appear to be a correct statement from Imam, Imam al-Haramain. So Imam al-Haramain is right by saying that. To say that his father doesn't have no evidence and he has no proof for his statements. Now, he says this as there are no reports uh, of this from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu or those who followed in his footsteps from among the pious predecessors. Further, this is not a view of our companions have mentioned that Allah knows best. Upon, pros upon prostrating, it is, right, it is important that the individual adhere to the necessary etiquette with regards to posture and means of glorifying Allah. And so one's hands must be placed on the ground at the level of one's shoulders. So you, pray, you put your hands like this. You level it to your shoulders. So your hands is level to what? Your shoulders like this, hey? Level to one's shoulders, making sure to keep the fingers together and pointed towards the Qibla. One's hands must be outside of his sleeves and touching the ground, while keeping the elbows spread away from the sides and one's stomach must not be resting on his thighs. So don't put your stomach on your thighs, meaning your legs should be spread out. But times of necessity, if this place is tight and you can't, you have to, then that's something else. But generally speaking, your stomach and your thighs shouldn't touch. So you should be spread out, hey? In the case of women or hermaphrodites, their elbows are not to be So spread. you know what a hermaphrodite is? It's a he, she. So, a woman and a man who's like a woman, both of them. So you tend to see this concept that he keeps bringing up. This is not something in our culture and in our community we have any issue with. If a man is a he, she, he's still considered. But in the Arab community, you have to realize this is a problem for them. When before the one of the chapters, I jumped. I didn't want to talk about, he spoke about the Amrad. The Amrad is the man who doesn't never gain facial hair. He looks feminine. He's very soft like a female. He talks about lowering your gaze from that. Now that's something in the Arab community that's very, 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 very problematic for them. Very problematic. That they would find fitna from those type of people. That's not something uh, our community, I hope so. And our people don't suffer from, right brothers? Am I right? Yeah, lower your gaze from a woman, nah, I'm sah. It's a fitna for men. Like in a boy or a, a man who's got no facial hair. But this is a big problematic thing for them. So they mention it in their books of lowering the gaze and the fitna that he has and staying away from it. The ulama mentioned it. They stated because it was a community problem. So we shouldn't bring that out to the open mass and talk to them about these things because it's not something we, we even think of, right? We don't think about that stuff. So here he talks about the, the woman and the male. Within the scholars of the Madahibs, they mention that the woman's prostration should be different from the male's prostration. That she shouldn't spread herself out, she shouldn't do everything like the way. But that's incorrect. The woman's like the man. Khalas. None of this shyness that they're talking about and oh, she has to put herself, keep herself together and, and she shouldn't do that. All of that is what? It's null and void. Because the Prophet ﷺ came to, he was teaching who? The male and he was teaching the female. And all of them he was their teacher. And never did he ever say, I'm praying like the men and the women should pray differently. Does that make sense? And if it's shyness, then the Messenger Sallallahu knew the concept of shyness and he didn't say to the woman, you have to keep yourself together, you have to bring your legs together. He didn't say any of that. Lidalika, if you go to uh, the, uh, if you go to the, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, the Harab, and you, you, you see the elderly women, the elderly Pakistani, and so, sometimes you feel, feel like they, they just become a ball. 
the way they are, it's just like they're all just like that. Their legs is just, they're just literally, it's like someone who is sitting, who just put his head on the floor. Do you get my point? That's not a sujood. That's not a sujood in any way, form or shape. But he pushes that concept that she should keep herself together. The person prostrating must also ensure that the rest of his body is at a level higher than his head and should place his forehead and nose firmly on the ground while maintaining tranquility throughout his prostration. As for the means of glorification during the prostration or recitation, our companions have stated that the individual should glorify Allah in the same way he does during the normal prayer. This can be done by saying, glorified is my Lord the Most High, three times, and then saying, O oh Allah, to you I have prostrated in you, I have, and, in, and in you I have believed, and to you I have submitted. My face is prostrated to the one who created it, shaped it, split its ears and, and eyes with his power and might. Glory to be Allah, the best of creators. There's a point that came to my mind, and this is the concept of having the belief that, for instance, that at the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were practices that were done. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came with success for this world and that hereafter, alayhi salatu wasalam. And as we said that the prostration of the woman is exactly like the prostration of the men. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi came to teach each and every one of them. Are we together, brothers? The same way is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the same way is that the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Salam, his lessons that he would give, um, the, the salah that he would pray when it's the best of actions, he would pray like, like this and the women would be at the back. All these veils that are placed between the men and the women, like these curtains and these things that are put, there's no evidence for that. Are you with me? To say that the women have to be in a segregated section where walls are placed around them, this is not what the Prophet Sallallahu did. Nor did the pious predecessors do it. And to say that no, it's a fitna, the Prophet knew this fitna. And he was more knowledgeable than you in this fitna. Are you with me, brothers? He didn't do it. So we follow the Prophet in what he did, and we follow him what he left. And so if that sunnah has died in so many people's faces, and it's died out, yet re the reviving has to be done. Are you with me, brothers? It has to be? It has to be done. So that's the reality of the matter. That the Prophet Sallallahu would do prayer at the, the front and the woman would pray at the back. So the woman's sujood should be normal, but she should never pray in front of a man. Does that make sense? A woman shouldn't pray in front of a man. Where, where, she, should she, where should she pray? At the back. So if she's at the back, no one's going to see how, she, how her sujood is, what she's doing. She prays properly now. And she stays at the back. Okay? That's how the Prophet Sallallahu time was Alayhi Salatu But because some people have thought that they have taqwa and iman and the fight against the concept, I think they fall into extreme with this segregation. Extreme. Ziyada. And that is not piety in any no, no way, form or shape. So, we follow the sunnah in what which the Prophet did, we stay away from that which the Prophet stayed away from. So, and if the masajid can revive the concept of khutbah, where the men pray at the front and the women pray at the back with no veil, they should do so, do that. They should what? And this argument of saying that the people have changed and the time is different, ya akhi, that's a door you don't ever want to open. That door opens way let. It opens doors of corruption to say that the times are different. Then every single thing somebody can say the times are different. Are you with me? Now, <coughs> Or one can also say, Glory and holiness be belong to you, O Lord of the angels and the spirits. As mentioned, all these supplications may also be said during the normal prayers. Our companions have also stated that it is recommended that one say, O oh Allah, reward me for this and make it a provision for me that you keep with you and remove my sins by it, and accept it from me, just as you accepted it from your slave, Prophet Dawood, may Allah be pleased with him. May Allah, may the peace of Allah be upon him. This supplication is specific to this prostration, and should therefore be adhered to. Al-Ustaz Ismail al-Darir mentioned in his book. The word al-Darir means what? 
blind. Darir is somebody who's blind. So they used to name people blind. Like for example, Abu Qasim Muhammad ibn Firrah al-Shatibi rahimahullah al-Darir. He was Darir, right? He was blind. And Imam Shatibi was blind. Rahimahullah. And one of the things that were transmitted from him, and Imam Shatibi, you guys didn't know Imam Shatibi, right? Which one? Huh? Laqari, his name is called Abu Qasim. Some scholars call it Abu Muhammad. Difference of his kunya. Abu Shaq al-Shatibi is the one who wrote. Anyways, he was blind. And an imam who's teaching how to recite the Quran and is blind, how does it work? He has to see people's lips, right? And their teeth. And their tongue, where they're placing it. And he's an imam in this field. Imam. He was blind and he can tell the person's lips the way they were moving. And their tongue. He will tell everything. No, you're putting your tongue in the wrong place. Rahimahullah ta'ala. Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to teach that book we were listening to yesterday, Aqeelatul Atrab. Aqeelatul al Atrab, which is Fi Asna al Maqasid, Fi Marfi Rasmi al Mushaf, in how the Mushaf is written. And Imam al Shatib has a book on it. Inshallah ta'ala, when we do the kitab that we're starting on Monday, after that we can do the Aqeelatul Atrab. The one he was reading, yes. We'll do that kitab, inshallah. How the Mus'haf was written and how the Qur'an was written. Naam. He mentioned in his book, the Tafsir, that Imam Shafi'i preferred the supplication in Surah Al-Isra. Glory, glory be to our Lord. Verily the promise of our Lord shall come to pass. Ayah 108. Here he uses the word Ustad, Ismail al-Darir. Ustad, right? Is that word is that word the thana? Is that a big praise? Nah, for the Shafi'iya and back in the days, yeah, they used to use it as a big thing. Ustad meant like it was a sheikh and stuff like that. It was praising somebody. But generically speaking today, Ustad is what? Just teacher. Sah? Does it have does it have any other bigger meaning today? So it's not wala to zakku an fusakum hu a'lamu bimani taqa. Ustad doesn't hold that meaning. It just merely means teacher. Yes. All it means is what? It means teacher. Nah. The, attribu the attribution of this statement to, in, to Imam Shafi'i is established through a very scarce chain of narration. The opinion, however, is sound as the Quran praises those who say this while prostrating. It is hence recommended that one combine between these different supplications while prostrating. Shafi'i held the view that a person should say in a sujood tilawa, Subhana Rabbina in kana wa'du Rabbina la maf'ula, that they should say that. In the sujood tilawa, but you're not, you're not reading on the ground of what? Of it being Quran, because you can't read a Quran in a poem. Huh? Just with the intention it changes. So when you're reading this, you're not reading as though it's an ayah from the Qur'an, you're reading it as, as though it's a, as a dhikr and a dua. So where did he say that? That transmission from what? Where did he say that transmission from, Shafi'i? The attribution of this statement to Imam Shafi'i is established through a very scarce chain of narration. What does he mean by scarce? Huh? Strange. Yes, yeah, scarce. Okay, good. That's good. okay. That's good. Yeah, that's what he says. A uh, very scarce, unheard of chain of narration. The opinion, however, is sound as the Quran praises those who say this while prostrating. It is hence recommended that one combine between these different supplications while prostrating and to invoke Allah for all one wants in this life and the next. If during prostration one says just some of these supplications. He will be rewarded for having glorified Allah, and if he doesn't say any of them, he will still be rewarded for having prostrated, as he would for prostrating in the normal prayer. Once the person prostrating has finished glorifying Allah and supplicating to him, he should raise his head, saying, "Allahu Akbar." There are two. There are two popular opinions uh, attributed to Imam Shafi'i regarding whether or not the salam needs to be said after prostration. The first opinion is that it is necessary, just as just as the takbiratul ihram is necessary, and in this case, 
the entire ritual will take on a form similar to that of the funeral prayer. This opinion is supported by an authentic narration by Ibn Abu Dawood, stating that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud would prostrate upon reading a verse of prostration and then say the salam. So the first, so what about the person when he does the uh, sujood tilawa? Does he have to do a salam? There are two opinions. Does he have to say salam alaikum? So he says the first one is, and it's the strongest to him, and it's the view of the majority of the scholars, is that he needs to. And it's like the janaza, the person has to say salam alaikum. And he used the hadith of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, which he says, Anna kana idha qara'a sajda, sajda thumma salama. So thumma salama means he would do his taslim. That's the first opinion. The second opinion? The second opinion is that it need not be said, just as it, just as it is not said when made during prayer. And because there is nothing to suggest that the Prophet wasallam did this. Among those who hold that the salam needs to be said, there are two opinions as to whether or not the tashahud needs to be said. The correct opinion is that it does not need to be said, just as it is not necessary for one prostrating to stand. Some of our companions have combined between the two issues and state that there are diff three different opinions as to, the, as to the necessity of saying salam and making tashahud. The first and most correct of these opinions is that the salam be said without the tashahud. The second opinion is that it neither be said, and the third opinion is that both are necessary. Among the predecessors who believe that, it is, that the salam is necessary, Muhammad ibn Sirin, Abdul Rahman al-Sulami, Abu Abdul Rahman al-Sulami, and Abu al-Ahwas, Abu Qalaba, Abu Qilaba, Abu Qilaba, and Ishaq ibn Rawaiya. Those holding the view that the salam is not necessary include Hassan al Basri, Sa'id ibn Jubayr, Ibrahim al Nakhayi, Yahya ibn Wahid, and Imam Ahmed. Yahya ibn Yes, Yahya ibn Wathab, yeah. Yahya ibn Wathab and Imam Ahmed. Sometimes you can't blame the translator, he's probably using a bad Arabic copy. This copy is, as I said, is the most strongest copy that Ibn Hajj one. So he might, he might have translated it from one of those bad translations, uh, bad Arabic, and he brings those kind of translations. So that's why when you're translating a book, you should always look for the best copy of it. It is, the, it is important to bear in mind that all of the above mentioned opinions pertain to the frustration of recitation made outside of the prayers. That which pertains to the second situation within the prayer, if one prostrates for recitation during prayers, he does not need to say the takbirat al ihram, but it is recommended for him to say Allahu Akbar without raising his hands when prostrating, and he should do the same thing when rising up from prostration. This is the correct and most popular opinion according to the majority of scholars. Among our companions, Abu Ali ibn Abu Huraira was, the, was of the view that the takbir is made only when prostrating and not when rising back up. So the person just says Allahu Akbar when they go into the sujood and when they get out of the sujood, they just leave. They don't have to say Allahu Akbar again. The first opinion, however, is the more popular of the two. As for the manner of prostrating and that which is said during the prostration, much of what we have said about the first situation prostrating outside the prayers applies to this situation of prostrating within the prayers. Also, if the one prostrating is the imam, he should not prolong the prostration unless he knows the, con the congregants prefer this. He shouldn't. Remember when you're leading a prayer, you should observe the people you're leading. You shouldn't be very evil in lengthening and... Uh, what you should do is Observe the people you're leading. If you can hear a child crying, all of these are things that you need to take into consideration. If you know there's elderly people praying with you, if you know that there are women praying with you and everything, you need to observe the prayer like that. Now. Upon rising up from the prostration of, of recitation during the prayers, the individual should move immediately to the standing position and not assume the relaxing sitting up position on his way. This is one of the scarcely mentioned issues that hardly anyone has discussed. 
Among the few who have discussed this are, are Al Qadi Hussein and Al Bawak Baghawi and Al Rafi. The, uh, the importance of mentioning this lies in the fact that the correct and chosen view taken by Imam Shafi and the further supported by authentic narrations in Al Bukhari and other books of Hadith regarding the relaxing sitting position. It is that it is recommended after the second compulsory prostration of the first rak'ah and the third rak'ah in the and uh, the third rak'ah and the fourth rak'ah salah. One must stand upright after having completed the prostration of recitation, and it is recommended that this, that something of the Quran Quran be recited after bowing. It is but before bowing. It is, however, permissible for one who has risen from the prostration of recitation to bow with reciting anything at all. Section. Regarding the preferred times for recitation. The most preferred time for, for reciting the Qur'an in prayers, according to the Shafi'i school of thought and others, prolonging recitation while standing in prayer is better than prolonging the prostration. Aside from during prayer. So the question is, is which one is better, prolonging the sujood or pro prolonging the, the qiyam? So according to him, the Madhab al-Shafi'i and the other opinions is tatwil al qiyami lengthening the prayer, sorry, lengthening the stand is better than lengthening the sujood. The reason why is, what is what is it called? What is it called, the Salah at night? It's named after what? The standing. It's named after the standing. So that's the virtue. But then the others argue and they say, because Allah says to the Prophet, Inna rabbaka ya'lamu annaka taqoom adna. Allah knows you stand. And the prayer is a component of standing and ruku' and sujood and everything else. But Allah is saying, I know that you stand at night. So they said the reason why Allah mentioned that is because it's the most virtuous. Some scholars, they say, La, the uh, sujood is the best because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallam, said, Aqrabu ma yakunu la abdu li rabbihi wa huwa sajid. The time when the person is most closest to his Lord is when he's in a state of prostration. Fa'akthiru fi du'ai wa antu fi sujood. So lengthen in the sujood. That's when you're most closest to who? You're most closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So lengthen your prayer, uh, lengthen your sujood. So here the scholars, they differ within themselves. Which of the two are better? Afdal as salah or they say which one is better? Tatweel al qiyami fi salati or tatweel al sujood, lengthen in the sujood. Aside from during prayers, the best time to recite is during the nights. And recitation during the second half of the night is better than to recite during the first half. It is also recommended that one recite between Maghrib and Isha. The best time to recite during the day is after the Fajr prayer, the dawn prayer. Other than the obligatory prayers, what's the best prayer? The Qiyam is better at night, right? Qira'atul Layl at night time. And within the night, what time is even better? Nisf al Akhir, the last third. The last half of sorry, the last half of the night is better than the first half of the night, and the reading between Maghrib and Isha is really is recommended as well. The reason why it's recommended is because people tend to want to go sleep. To finish off your day with the Quran is very good. As for the reciting at daytime, as for reading at daytime, the best time to read at daytime is after Salatul Fajr. Naam. After the dawn prayer, and it is not disliked that one recites at any other time during the day for a meaningful reason. As for that which was narrated by Ibn Dawood, stating that Mu'ayyan ibn Rifa'a Rifa has reported that his teachers that his teachers disliked reciting after Asr under the pretext that it was the studying time of the Jews. Naam, Mu'ayyan ibn Rifa'a. He's narrated from his teachers, "Anam kerihul qiraat abad al asr," reciting after asr, and they said, "Who are the asr to Yehudin?" It's the studying of the Jews. Now he refutes this and he says, 
He says that this is unacceptable as there is no origin for this statement. Yeah, not acceptable. The statement of his has no foundation. Because the kalam of the ulama is a proof. It's not proof. They need a proof. The scholars, they need a proof for their statements. So since uh, Mu'an ibn Rifa'a's argument has no proof, it is rejected. Hey?